your host, Lori Sortino, and I'm here at the Serious Play Conference in Redmond, Washington with Andy Phelps. Hello, Andy. Hi. Tell me what brings you here. Um, well, Clark asked me to come talk about uh, games and creativity, which is sort of an odd pairing. Um, I'm kind of excited to do it. I haven't done this talk before, uh, so it was kind of interesting to to want to do that. I've known Clark a long time and, and followed his work and the, the serious games and movement and and all of the folks that are, are sort of in this space. Um, we kind of all grew up together. You know, we were there at RIT 10 or 12 years ago when no one in education was really looking at games super seriously, um, at least at the, the higher ed level. And, you know, as, as the program at RIT has built up um, and as serious games movement has sort of built up we've kind of all stayed interconnected and looked at what that's going so he asked me out here to speak on that um, and I'm pretty excited to do so so games and creativity and when you mentioned that you said you kind of gave the impression that that was an odd combination yeah I mean you know a lot of people look at games and and we understand game development to be a very creative act right we it's a creative industry it, it operates like Hollywood it you know does all these things that we sort of think of but when we talk about people playing games we often talk about you know well they're just gonna um, sort of figure out what the what the underlying rule set is they're gonna distill the pattern that the game is based on and then they're gonna sort of optimize towards that and come up with with the solution that was already there they just had to discover it uh, and I think what we're seeing now in games is that's not really the case, that people are coming up with their own solutions, that people are coming up with their own uh, vocabularies, their own um, cultures, their own ways of interacting with these things that were not intended by the designers. Uh, they weren't intended necessarily um, as the win state of the game, um, but they're becoming more and more interesting and, and that's what I'm, that's one of the things that we're starting to focus on a lot at RIT and the way we, we look at game players is there's that, that sort of front edge, right, that doesn't know what they're doing and is constantly in this hyper mode of discovery and we're looking at them and saying, what's the process that they're doing that and, and what does that teach us about creativity? So the mindset shift, I definitely get how um, it wasn't expected that there would be a mindset shift, and yet it, it is occurring. And what I mean by that is we are seeing how creatively people play games. And so you're incorporating that into now the design of the game, yes? In part. Um, I mean, you're obviously, you know, people have figured, you know, that there's a bunch of, of stuff in the game design community where people have sort of looked at that and they've said, well, okay, so it makes a lot of sense to not give one specific path to do something and we're gonna we're gonna let it be a little bit more free form and let players come up with their own solutions but a lot of times the the gates or the hurdles that we put in place um, you know are, are very traditional right uh, or or very locked down um, you know and then you you see something like uh, like rocket jumping Right, it, which is this just bizarre phenomenon that somebody thought, well, you know, actually the, the best way to beat a quake level is to point your own rocket launcher at your feet, um, you know, and, and that will propel you faster than you could have possibly run. Uh, very creative. <laughs> very creative, right? Um, so how did that happen, right? Or, or, you know, looking at people that are, are killing themselves over and over and over in multiplayer, early multiplayer games in order to leave a bunch of corpses that would give messages to the people that came into the zone after them, right? Or it, because there was no there was no tool to leave a message, right? It was a it was not a transformable environment at that time. So, looking at the ways that people are finding cracks or ways around the systems um, that were intended by the developers is one of the things that I'm starting to spend more and more of my time on. What I'm hearing, both in what you're saying and what I'm hearing outside in the rest of the conference, is this aspect of social psychology and what we're learning about ourselves and our own uh, interaction in the physical world by um, looking at what's going on in these games and virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, it, it's reinforcing some things I think that we already knew, but it's casting a very different flavor 
uh, to some of those things. So, you know, I could make the statement that, that creativity is generally born of repetition, right? And, and everyone from art school would understand that, right? Everyone would sort of like, oh yes, right? You draw every day, and then at a certain point you do something that you didn't expect to do, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but I think that games have this unique way of, of reflecting that back to us in a much more collaborative way uh, than we've traditionally thought about it, in a, in a much richer, um, uh, more immediate construct in terms of its social aptitude. Because something happens in a game where somebody you know, makes a leap, understands something, um, and that will instantly transform the culture of everyone that's playing that game. And it'll bleed outside of that game very, very quickly, given all the ties to social media and communications and all the rest. Um, so it's it's a way it, it's a it's sped up the way that we that we talk about it. It's sped up the way that it influences the next uh, iteration, um, and it's also become becoming a much more collaborative practice and. and these are all the things that everybody's talking about in education, that everybody's talking about in terms of productivity, everyone's talking about in terms of, of workforce and, and all of this stuff, right? National competitiveness and, and all this. These are the same um, idioms that, that we want to come at in all of those ways, and yet it's happening in games. And that discussion is limited to the people that currently are playing them. Uh, and so what's going to happen as that sort of branches out within our culture is that's going to become really, really empowering um, to understand the ways that that helps us learn about ourselves. So to take a step toward spreading the, the uh, number of people who are playing games, in other words, spreading this good thing that's going on in this smaller sector of the community. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you see as a potential next step for people to really enroll themselves, sure. um, get involved, play games yeah. in maybe another way? Or um, So I think it's, it's already starting to occur, but I think it's twofold. One is, is more people are going to play more and varied and different types of games. And that's, that's healthy, it's what happens when we introduce new media to a society, right? There's, there's going to be more things, there's going to be more specialized things, there's going to be more things that appeal to different types of, of players and, and all of that kind of stuff, right? And that's important. Mm -hmm. But the second thing that's important is as it becomes, or continues to become, it's fairly accepted now in certain circles, but as it becomes a continually accepted form of entertainment, we start to reflect on it. Right? There starts to be that sort of, you know, the way that, that society currently reflects on film and what film is saying about, you know, the society that produces it, right? We're starting to see that about games. We're starting to see that about interactive entertainment in a way that, that we haven't even just 10 years ago. Um, and so that is also going to inform someone's playing, right? Is, is that notion of not just playing, but of, of actively critiquing play and actively thinking about what that engagement is doing, right? And you see it now uh, ever more so even in, in young people coming into our program because um, they come in and they're, they're critical of media, right? They're, they're coming in saying, well, I like this about this game and I don't like this about this game and, and I'm interested in why this game works, right? And they're still relatively narrow. You know, they're still focusing mostly on themselves, which is partly a function of age and partly a function of it being a new medium. And they're still focusing on, on often the, the one or two types of experiences that they really like rather than, you know, a breadth. Um, but at least they're coming into it saying they understand it's a, it's a created artifact and it could be created differently and they want to get involved in its creation. And so there's that sort of meta-awareness of, of how am I going to come at this. And I think that just flows really well into letting you talk about your passion and why you do what you do. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, we started games at RIT when, when nobody was, was doing games in higher ed, or almost nobody. There were, there were a few pockets around. Um, and we got into it because, well, for two reasons. One is um, we were talking to industry, and industry was saying we like to hire very traditional 
computer engineers, computer scientists, these kinds of folks, and then uh, we um, have to sort of retrain them to work with an artist or to work with a, a production team or to, to work with anybody on the creative side about how this works. And for some reason we were having this really strange dialogue around how computer science wasn't a creative discipline, which was totally bizarre in, in that era, but a bunch of people believed it, I guess. And at the same time, we were, we were talking to our students and saying, what do you want to do? What are you passionate about doing? And they were saying, well, I really want to learn how to build these things. I really want to learn what it takes to build these things, how they're made, why they're made the way they are, can we make them better, you know, all this kind of stuff. And as we got into it, we started to see that this was a platform, not only that, that we could, you know, meet them at sort of the, uh, meet them at their passion, Right, which was something that we were really excited about. Um, but it was also a way to take them deeper into uh, a whole bunch of different fields and a whole bunch of, of really interesting learning um, that really you know, could, could really enrich their educational experience uh, all across the campus um, by using this as, as kind of a focal point for, um, for the kinds of things that they wanted to study. So, that was our impetus in getting into it, and since then it's just kind of blossomed. I mean, it's just, it's everywhere now, and, and we're hugely excited by it, and I get to go to work and, and interact with a bunch of really smart, really talented, uh, very fun students. You have, in that, uh, applying for that program at RIT, the top students in the country applying for game design, mm -hmm. and um, what are the degrees that they can get right now? Right now, we offer uh, a Bachelor of Science in Game Design and Development and a Master's of Science in Game Design and Development. Um, we're about a year away from doing a combined BSMS program as well. Uh, and we also offer a Bachelor of Science in New Media Interactive Development uh, out of the same school and same faculty. Um, so that's, that's what we've got on the table right now. But obviously, we're constantly looking at, at more.